You are listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina, brought to you by iWalker, flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. That's iwoca.co.uk. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Rose Manley. Hi, Richard. Hi, Rose. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. We're, we're doing another, you know, distanced, co- distanced podcast again. Not the same, is it? No, I mean, it's not. And you don't know who I'm looking at on the screen when I say, and I'm joined by Orla Shinui. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Orla. You enjoy the power of that too much, Richard. Mm. <laughs> Always loves the power. Toes. It's all he gets. How are you both? Orla, you're in a new a new place by the looks of things. Yes, I'm in a new abode. We moved house this week. Um, so finally settled as proper Amsterdamers and broken from it. Man alive, I forgot how hard it is to move house. You know, this is our... F- actually, realised my daughter is five. This is the fifth home that she's lived in. So I should know how much of an effort it is to move house. But I forget. I think you just push it to the back of your mind. But we're hoping to stay here for a little bit. Um, mm. So yeah, yeah. And Rose, just a little, and Rose, you, you I think, um, in my mind's eye, you've just been sitting there for four months in that in that room, <laughs> in this yellow room, in that one room, in the yellow they room. They never let me out. They just bring my meals up, <laughs> and my beers, and then that's it. You do get, you do get out, do you? I do. I've been. I was at the beach this week, so um, I was going to say, there's a window not, behind you. Surely you could climb out if nothing else. Yeah, I know. Break it if nobody lets like Rapunzel you. Rapunzel or something. No, um. Uh, yeah, but we say that, but then Richard, you're literally always in that small corner of your shed. <laughs> yeah, but it, so he well, is I, li- I literally there, am always here. I literally am always here. This is where I live. He opens the door to have a wee into the garden and then, then retreats back in again. <laughs> please, Orla. Oh God. Please. Um, listen, we're in late June. Are we confident that we're inching towards racing, resuming? I, when, I, when I look at the, the list of interviews and subjects to talk about tonight, it, there's not much sort of coronavirus there luckily it's more optimistic isn't it we're sort of i think we're growing in confidence are we maybe or well you both look quite skeptical about that no no i i'm surprising myself by being quite confident that it's all going to start up again i I really wasn't sure and i think even by the time we were recording last month's podcast i would have said i didn't think it would happen but i think now that france have have opened up um i sort of loosened a little bit when it comes to the number of people who can gather, you know, up to 5,000 people. That made me think, okay, well, the Tour de France probably will happen then. And if the Tour de France happens, then it, it does open the door for everything else. So, yeah, and we've, ha- we've had men's, we've, you know, we've had racing. I, I, f- I feel like it probably will, actually. I think it probably will. Rose? I, I change my mind every day pretty much on it. I think, <laughs> I think, I think it will happen, but I still can't get round you think, the logistics you think it will of it happening. <laughs> I think it's going to go ahead, but I just can't work out... You know, for me, standing on the finish line, how am I going to get a shot of the winner coming across the line without t- rubbing up against uh, hundreds of people, which is kind of basically basically what my job entails. <laughs> <laughs> the un- that sounds way more story. fun than it actually is, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I can't get around the uh, logistics of it. And just thinking about... Um, my uh, partner's parents are, are, well, his mother is Croatian. And they've been staying in Croatia the whole time in, in Zadar, which has been completely unaffected by coronavirus until this Novak Djokovic tennis tour happened and essentially brought the whole virus to the whole of this town that had been untouched before and has shut everything down again. So with that happening, then it makes me think, well, are they, you know, are, are these countries, are these cities really going to be happy for that to happen? I don't know. That's I think it, it definitely depends on what your experience has been, doesn't it? I mean, here in Amsterdam, the kids are fully back at school. Restaurants are open. You know, they're at the social distancing is in place, but it's not respected everywhere. I mean, I was at the supermarket earlier and I was standing just a little bit back from the till and some young guy walked between me and the till. And I thought, wow, that's really close. But that's fairly normal here I guess so I think that what your version of norm is also determines how much you think 
we, how close you think we are to, to everything opening up again. So this is after Richard said, oh, there's not much coronavirus on the agenda yeah. today. <laughs> Sorry yeah, about let's that. Move on, well, let, we? let's that, move on. That, yeah, I mean, let, let's let's retain a, a sort of sense of optimism because certainly in women's cycling, there's been some kind of exciting news, mm. you know, about new contracts, riders, new sponsors, you know, high profile moves. We're going to talk a bit about all of that. Um, but I think you've got the news roundup. Have you, Orla? We certainly do. Um, and yeah. I don't think I've got a, even a sniff of coronavirus in this. Let's see. Yeah, after a very public dispute with Team Valkenberg, who threatened to take legal action against her, the world number one rider, Lorena Vibis, has seen out uh, her mutually agreed time with the squad and now signed with Sunweb until the end of 2024. The Dutch national champion had wanted to leave the team at the end of last year, we'll remember, but wasn't allowed to. And after it all almost ending up in court, both parties agreed to stay together until the 1st of June. So they have now parted ways and Vibis will restart the season as and when it does get underway with the Women's World Tour team. Now, looking ahead to the new revised calendar, two events won't be on it this year. Oh man, I only got to the second part of the news roundup and we are actually talking coronavirus. Anyway, <laughs> (laughs) Um, The Ladies Tour of Norway and the Vargarda races have both been cancelled this year because of the rules on social distancing and travel restrictions. The organisers of the events said that they couldn't get the government assurances that they needed that the situation would have changed sufficiently on time. So they've had to be cancelled with doubt also sadly thrown on the planned new Battle of the North, which was due to take place across Scandinavia next year. Um, so for this year, it means that we're looking at 15 women's world tour events, should they all go ahead from August. We are due to get a new virtual race, and it may keep those who keep demanding a women's tour to France happy. I'm not one of them, so I wouldn't know. Um, but ASO have announced a new women's six-stage virtual tour to France, which is the same duration as the men's, and it's due to take place across the three weekends when we would have had the normal tour to France. Speaking of virtual races, the three-day V-Series Women's Tour was won by Leah Dixon of Tibco SVP, who also won Stage 2 with Catherine Hulverf of NXTG Racing winning Stage 3 and Annie Christmas of Lotto Sudal taking Stage 1. Christine Mazuris and Julian Dora are to stay with the new title sponsor of their team, SD Works, having signed a contract extension with what is currently Bowles Dolmans. Dora has uh, extended for one year, Mazuris for two, and British rider Anna Shackley has also signed with the team in a two-year contract. Scottish rider, no less. Scottish <laughs> rider, no less. Stick a kilt on it. Um, she finished just outside the top 10 at the Junior Worlds last year and is also a national track champion. And in other team news, Lars Boom has been signed as a performance director with CCC Live. The Tour de France stage winner and former cyclocross world champion is looking to the first woman's Paris-Roubaix in October because he finished at fourth there, of course, in 2015. And finally, the big news I think you were referring to, Richard, uh, before we started the news roundup, was Big Le Katusha, um having been saved after a public appeal for support when they lost both title sponsors. The French fashion label Paul K has taken over the team and will finance the squad until 2024. So in any uh, climate, that would be hugely encouraging news, but especially right now, a four-year uh, sponsorship deal is fantastic news for that squad. And that's your news roundup. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina, brought to you by iWalker, flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. That's i w o c a.co.uk. I'm Liv Denya. I'm a product manager working on iWalker's new product, iWalker Pay. We help businesses offer payment terms to their customers without taking on credit risk. So I'm organising a charity bike ride from London to Brighton and we're raising money for the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust. Lots of us at iWalker are participating and iWalker's matching donations made by employees. So, so far we've raised £3,000, which is really exciting. We picked cycling because it's a sport that we love at iWalker and a ride like this is a great way for us to come together and try and accomplish something as a community. So the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust works with communities and young people from disadvantaged and underrepresented backgrounds. 
and it's named after Stephen Lawrence, who was a black British teenager that was murdered in a racially motivated attack. But his murderers were only found guilty and brought to justice in 2012. And an independent review concluded that the original investigation had been affected by institutional racism. And in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and many others, we wanted to support a cause like this. We're all really horrified by the police brutality we're seeing in the U.S., it's really important to remember that institutional racism like this exists in the UK too and to work to change that. Well that was Liv from Iwaka there. Um, it sounds like a, a great initiative, uh, the London to Brighton bike ride that she's organising so hopefully at some point this year and we're very grateful to our title sponsor Iwaka. Uh, if you run a small business um, and especially if your business has been affected by coronavirus, sorry there I go again, um, go on to the iwaka.co.uk website and uh, there's lots of information and resources there to help you. And you can register for a Sybil, a coronavirus interruption, a uh, business interruption loan scheme. And they'll be uh, they'll be issued soon. So go to iwaka.co.uk if you run a small business, they might be able to help you. Um, now, Orla, you finished your news roundup with the, I mean, surprising news of this new sponsorship for Big La Katusha. The situation was so looking so dire for them. They had a crowdfunding appeal going, and you know, even in the best of times, landing a a, a big sponsor, a, a non cycling sponsor on a on a multi year deal, which has you know resulted, we believe, in 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 you know pay rises for riders and and certainly security that they didn't have before. It's remarkable. Uh, we're going to hear from them now, aren't we? Yeah. Um. And I wanted to pursue this a little bit because it's good news for all the reasons that you just mentioned, but also because I think it's a wonderful departure, if that's what it becomes, for women cycling, for women's sport in general. I've long wanted to see a fashion label, a cosmetics brand, a beauty brand get involved in women's sport and women's cycling just to see where it can take it. And so I'm really excited about this because we know that the vast majority of fans and active supporters of women's cycling are currently men, which is a wonderful thing. But wouldn't it be great to be able to tap into the female market a little bit and bring more women into becoming sports fans in general, cycling fans in general, you know, bringing them into the women's side of it and the men's side of it. And so I was always fascinated by whether or not um, a collaboration like this could maybe manage to do that and, and tap into it. Um, so I wanted to pursue that thinking really and see if that was what the um, sponsors themselves had in mind. So I caught up with the new owner of Polka, Matthias Toma, and also with the uh, Thomas Campagna, the uh, team manager, to hear what both of them had to say. So here's my chat with them. Tell me how this sponsorship came about then. Um, I read initially an article uh, in one of the online publications in Switzerland that the team had been left high and dry by their two sponsors. And uh, at that moment, I just thought this might be an interesting opportunity to talk to someone who is in this industry. And so I reached out to them through the website, like a general info. And um, over the course of two conversations, the idea evolved um, on how to maybe sponsor the team. At that time, it was more of a soft idea because we didn't quite know where we wanted to put it. Because parallel to this, I was not yet in closing uh, um, the takeover of this company, of this fashion label. Uh, and as that firmed up, we made more and more uh, precise plans on how to actually um, handle the sponsorship. And so were you already interested in women's cycling or how did this flash across your radar? Um, well, generally I was interested in cycling. Um, women's cycling obviously less. However, I was on this fashion side and men's cycling wouldn't really lend itself because I can't put uh, all these strong men into very beautiful female dresses. <laughs> and there needed to be a, a crossover a synergy effect. And so it wasn't just about putting a name onto a jersey. Um, that anybody can do that. An insurance can now do that. A bakery can do that. that. That doesn't do anything beyond your name being seen in TV or, or when the commentators uh, mention the team. What was more interesting for me was the, the fact that with women's cycling, you actually have the women, you have the, one of the core uh, target groups that we want to sell to, to, to show the brand. 
And so they won't just hopefully not just be wearing the tricots, but maybe outside of their, their job on the bicycle, uh, they might be wearing some of our styles. And as you know, uh, women's cycling is such an inexpensive sport that even though these women have professional contracts, they still are classified as amateurs when it comes to uh, the Olympics. Whereas for the men's, they have to have special exemptions that they are still allowed to ride because they are actually really making money. Does th- does that make it more of, maybe this is an obvious question, forgive me if it is, but does it make it more of a an interesting business proposition in that sense? It, because It is, look, here it is, it is actually both. Um, as you know, if you sponsor a women's team, um, you can do that for one million. If you sponsor a, this, a men's team, it doesn't go under 10 million. Um, so yes, there is, and the, the media exposure is not quite the same, but the men don't get 10 times more exposure for all that money. So yes, it's it's good spending. However, you're also doing something that is very beneficial to uh, a, a women's team because without the sponsoring, they wouldn't be in existence. And so everybody gets what they want out of it. You know, a good deal is usually a deal where both sides walk away and are very happy with the conditions. Most of the fans still of of women's cycling are men and and traditionally fans of men's cycling who've crossed over to women's cycling. And I've been thinking that the sport's crying out for somebody to have the vision to try to expand that fan base, you know, and tap into something else that women are interested in and to bring them into the sport that way. Is that part of your ambition? Is that part of your marketing plan? Uh, to some part, you know, there's a, I think there's a misconception and I, I have the same misconception. I thought all the women that are competitors in bicycle races are essentially um, very strong, very uh, athletic, and they're only athletic. Um, and I had to learn that most of them, when they're not in, in their cycling clothes, they are just like any other uh, women. They can be just as charming, and they can can be just you know get their Cinderella moment, uh, like like um, what you would have in in this idea of marketing and in this idea of uh, making it known to a bigger public. And with that respect, I think uh, a women's cycling team is the perfect so to speak, brand ambassador for a fashion brand because it shows that this is everyday fashion. Everybody can wear it. They look good in it. Um, it will make them feel nice. And uh, by extension, then also the normal customer, when they see normal guys wearing this and not just supermodels on the photo, uh, will see that there's a lot of value in, in attaching yourself with a, a brand. And obviously, it's, it's a cross effect. So we market them, they market us. There is so much difficulty, I guess, facing all women's sports teams right now in particular, um, and cycling certainly isn't exempt from that. Did you expect the process of finding a replacement sponsor to be more difficult, given the current climate? Usually when you run into a situation, you get nervous. I was never nervous, so you can say it afterwards, but it was really because it, it comes to management. I have, I have companies at the same time. I have a distribution company. We were running in, in, seri- in serious problems with the shutdown and all the closes were shop or close so then you need to manage the situation and I have to say and I'm, I'm always calling for that to, to, to be more united in cycling and if you look to our case we addressed our problem to cy- to Swiss cycling we addressed our problem to, to the UCI and we never had one one minute of delay in, in, in discussing or getting answers or getting permissions to open up bank guarantees so we gave a, we gave a clear plan how we wanted to, to navigate uh, during those months and um, everybody was supporting us on top as a surplus of course the, the, um, the media was su- supporting us in, in presenting the problem but also if you look at the crowdfunding and people were giving us so it was a united situation probably sometimes we need in cycling nobody wants this situation but to have a real a real hard situation to understand that we can only survive when we are united and, and I, I have experienced a lot of things even though a lot of people say negative things about federations or the world government body but they were all very very supportive they, they, they changed their rules almost for us in order to give us more and as much as possible space to find such a sponsor if they would have shut down we would have no chance uh, to go for another two months yeah so that, that was I think the most important thing for me <coughs> there's there always something and I think out of this process, the process we went through, we all need to learn that we have something in hand which can be very interesting for the industry. And I think Paul, Paul Carr is the first company who understands the value of the sponsorship because 
Also, they have calculators. They say that we put so much in and we want to get that out. And this is probably a very good investment for us here. And, you know, my dream was always to have fashion combined with the beauty of cycling, women cycling. And this is going to happen. And I'm, I'm really motivated to show that there's much, much more. Of course, now this year we have to settle things and we have to bring the team back, start new jerseys. But for next year, we want to really show something new and exciting. And I think that is now possible with this sponsor. Well, one thing that really jumped out there, Orla, was the comment in passing, really, that he mentioned the figure of a, a million pounds. And I'm not sure if that is the budget uh, for the team. But he said, you know, f- you can sponsor a, a tenth of a, a men's team for a million pounds or a, a women's team for a million pounds. That certainly represents better value. You you own the women's team. The, your name is all over it. And he said, as he said, he doesn't think that would mean 10 times less publicity uh, so it does seem like uh, good business sense but it's uh well it's going to be fascinating to see how it develops as you say a completely new kind of sponsor in women's cycling and cycling generally have you been on their website checking out their stuff what you know what what's their market at the moment i have been on their website it's it's quite um dressy quite a young audience it sounds like they're they're relaunching or remarketing in some way I think maybe even a younger audience but one thing I was really interested in was was his um suggestion that someone like Chanel you know could come into the sport in in a few years time if this was to work out and it really struck me how much of a no-brainer almost that would be for for a big fashion house because they've got you know these huge amounts of turnover and for a pittance of that the positive PR that they could get out of sponsoring a women's team would be phenomenal. They've got access already to all these high-end, you know, glossy magazines and campaigns and the name of itself just stands out. So if you're associating yourself then with a women's sports team, the empowering message that brings, the positive message that brings, the goodwill that brings to your brand, I would think would be absolutely phenomenal, you know, and, and in a while it would be, um, a fresh avenue for sports teams. It would also be fresh for a fashion house, you know, it'd be something completely different. And and they wouldn't be talking to a crowded market. They'd be the only one doing it to begin with. You know, I think it would be phenomenal. But I would say that, but, I, you know, it would be. I think it was actually really nice to hear um, Matthias also say what a great thing, in a way, women's cycling being small and growing and emerging is. Because I think a lot of the time... We kind of focus too much on it being comparing it to the men's and it doesn't have as much exposure as the men's you know there's not as much tv as the men's it doesn't get the crowds uh, well it many probably does get the crowds that the men's does most of the time and it doesn't have that big flagship tour de france so i think it was so refreshing to hear from a business perspective why uh, women's cycling is such a great investment and because he's putting it's a multi-year deal we're talking about I think that is complete proof uh, up front that this is this makes good business sense, and I think that's such a good precedent to set, isn't it? I tell you what, there's there's got to be pressure on them to come up with half decent kit, no? Yeah, I mean, that's true. if it's an absolute dog's <laughs> dinner, that's not going to reflect very well on a fashion house, is it? Sartorial Richard Moore. I mean, their their kit or the big like Katusha kit was outstanding. I mean, you know, if if you were looking at Okay, we haven't had much racing this year, but th- that is a team that definitely started the season very well. Um, in the in the little racing there had been, um, they looked like a very united uh, group. You know, they they've had uh, Ashley Moom and Passio, and then Cecilia Trip Ludwig as 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 real leaders of that team. And without that sort of talisman in place, they they looked like a stronger unit. And uh, Lizzie Banks, we know well, of course, presents service course. Started the season very well, and and you know she spoke a lot about how how they felt as a team that they really felt they were onto something good. So, you know, if if a a brand was paying attention to that and looking for a team that may well punch above its weight, then it's it you know it might also be a good investment from that point of view, from a sporting point of view. I feel like I have to revise slightly. Sorry um, to interrupt. Just Richard, you when when you asked me what the um, attire is like, I I'd only clicked on party wear the first time, so I should maybe just had revise quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing I go to, to dress for the event you want to be invited to rather than what you're actually at. Um, but I've just clicked on workwear. And just in case anybody thinks that that's my idea of what, like in inverted commas, young people wear. It's quite, it, 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 the workwear is actually quite blousy. It is quite sort of 
maybe middle-aged French. So now I understand maybe a bit better why they are relaunching mm. with a bit more of a younger focus. Um, I just wanted people, you know, I just wanted to clarify that um, that's not my idea necessarily of what a younger generation is wearing. It's probably more what, um, it's probably more aimed at me, but I'm in the party wear section. So my, you know. my, my <laughs> wife, my wife, who is a middle-aged French woman, uh, <laughs> was, well, she, some of my best friends are middle aged friends from me. She was very familiar with the brand and, and oh, was, was she? A, a oh. sto- yeah, and astonished that they were sponsoring a cycling team because for her, she does look at them as a um, more aimed at the, the sorry, older age group and, and more sort of formal clothing. Um, well, it's certainly for an, a more affluent age group anyway. Yeah, or, and, and or affluent as well. Italian. Yeah, it's she, quite she, expensive she, stuff. She, she mentioned expensive. that too. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, that was that was one big bit of news. Um, Paul Carr coming into cycling, and uh, we'll wait await the uh, the big unveil, the big reveal of the kit with a great deal of interest. The other big bit of news, I suppose, was Lorena Vibus um, completing her transfer to Sunweb in odd circumstances. I mean, uh, you know, the the original deal with Valkenburg Park Hotel Valkenburg was for her to ride first half of the season with them. Well, she she did win win a race, but didn't do an awful lot of racing. And she's managed to get her move now. There were a lot of teams interested in signing her. And um, she's the world's number one ranked rider, as you say. And um, speaking to her, it seemed it wasn't that difficult a choice. She's been uh, on the Sunweb radar for quite some time. So here is Lorena Vibus talking about her move. And Hans Timmermans, one of the coaches, director of sportives at Team Sunweb. Your move is one of the one of the big stories of the last the last few months. Um, how pleased are you to finally have moved uh, and to have joined Team Sunweb? Yeah, I'm really happy with that and uh, it's a great step in my career to join Sunweb and I'm really looking forward to the races. There were a lot of teams apparently interested in signing you. Why did you choose Sunweb? What was it that they offered you or told you that persuaded you that that was the best team for you? First of all, they give me a lot of trust. Yeah, they based in the Netherlands. They, they have the Keep Challenging Center in Sittard. And that was uh, one of the points that uh, was also important for me because I'm r- still young. And for me, it felt good to have a base in Holland. And they have a lot of talented young riders who also will develop in the next few years. So I think this team will grow into the future with a lot of strong riders. Do you see yourself then as part of a, a you know, a, an emerging team of, of, as you say, you know, riders like Leanne Lipper already won this year and is, is young like yourself, or is it a team that you think you'll you'll lead, that you'll get the support to to be the leader in a lot of races? Do you see yourself as, as part of a group or as, as the potential leader of the team? I think we have a lot uh, of cards to play in this team. With some races, I will be the leader. With other races, I will be a support rider. And I'm totally good with that because I also really have fun in supporting other teammates. Yeah, I think in this team, everyone gets their uh, chances to get a win or a podium. But we go for the win, of course. Mm. We, we obviously haven't seen too much racing this year, um, but you have won a race this year. So that suggests that you, you know you started the season well, but how difficult was it over the winter to remain focused on the job and to keep training hard when there was all this uncertainty around your future and obviously uh, you know a, a, a bit of a, a, an issue with your previous team and your desire to leave? You know how how difficult did you find it to just remain focused on the job? Till January, it was pretty difficult. I don't have a, mu- a lot of fun anymore in cycling and with training, but in January when everything was clear, I focused back on training even more and I was on training camp at the moment with the Dutch Federation. And at that moment I saw again progression in my training so that I uh, became better. And then I had also something like, oh, nah, the season uh, will be fine then. And I had more fun and... Uh, yeah, at that point it was was much better than before January. How has it been for you the last few months? I mean, how difficult has that period been when we haven't had any racing, obviously? Have you been able to, I guess in, in Holland, you've been able to train out on the road throughout that period, um, but how difficult have you found it? Uh, at the beginning, it was more difficult because I'm a rider who loves to race and I don't really like to train a lot. But now when I discovered some new roads in my area and uh, went to Limburg a few times, 
now I have more fun in training and I like to, uh, I like more than before this all to train four or five hours. So now it's everything fine and um, it's still not sure when really the race wa- are starting, but we have something to look at and that gives also some trust and uh, we build up again to the season and uh, yeah, I, f- I feel uh, with every training a bit more ready to uh, start the season over again. You as a team, I guess, must be delighted to have uh, signed her. I know there was quite a lot of competition, I think, for her. How, how did you make the case to her um, that she would be best off at, at Team Sunweb? Uh, I think when she was a junior, we had uh, already the first connection with her because then she was uh, at our talent days uh, that we always, every year have. Like we always invite the four biggest talents of the junior category. So that was the first connection that we had. And yeah, also through throughout the year, we had a lot of contact uh, that year. I think on that moment, she was uh, not ready yet to make the step to a World 2 level team. But also over the first years, we kept contact with each other and uh, there was just a good contact with each other on that part. So I think that was already that we had a little bit of an advantage uh, on that part. And she knew the team already a bit by uh, yeah, by, by that contact, wh- wh- how we work. So yeah, I think that was the main difference that we had compared to other teams. Were you surprised, you know, despite knowing her, knowing her talent, were you surprised at, at how she performed last year you know, was that was that ahead of schedule as far as you were concerned? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's also what we said uh, to her when we uh, when we spoke to her when it became more concrete that she was indeed uh, making huge steps in her first years. Uh, still, we also see that uh, that she's still s- super young, so we also need to be careful. We are not putting too much pressure on her. I think already now, and I think that combination that we are also still realistic that it will not be always uh, every year fifteen wins. <laughs> Mm. like she did last year i think that's also something that gave her confidence that we also are not giving her all the pressure that she needs to uh, always perform on that way i mean given that she is so young were you concerned over the winter at how the uncertainty around her future might be affecting her i mean were you able then to offer some support some reassurance and and how did you sort of ensure that that didn't derail her because I, I guess it might well she said it was difficult for a while to to remain focused on her job i mean how, how concerned yeah. were you the special thing with lorena is that she's uh, having a huge talent so she doesn't need too much training to become uh, to still be in a good shape that's also what she showed the last years i think uh, still when she was in park hotel that she's yeah, without so much training, still uh, on a really high level. So even when she had not such good times in that period, uh, still she was training a bit, uh, I know. Yeah, support, yeah, she was not in our team at that moment, so we could not give her too much support, but we had uh, sometimes contact with each other about how it was, of course, but uh, she's also just a strong personality. Of course, it's a difficult time, but I think she can handle also with this kind of... Uh, uh, scenarios not for everybody the same I guess I mean wh- I, one of the questions I asked her was whether at Sunweb she sees herself becoming the, the team leader or just one of quite a few you know rising stars you know in, in, with different different talents do you see what you're building at Sunweb as a, a real kind of ensemble of talents or yeah. do you see Lorena as becoming a kind of you know a, a principal leader of the team no, I think that's what it's exactly, exactly like you say. We have huge talents in different uh, in different qualities, and sometimes they overlap. I also believe that uh, that that will happen with Lorena in the future. That she will become uh, even better than she is now already in the classics. Uh, but also then, it's I think only an added value that you have a rider like her in the final, uh, together with, for example, uh, Floortje Makai or uh, Liana Lippert or Juliette Labousse. Yeah, those riders are also all f- from the same uh, young age still. That's also what we are. What we started building uh, three, four years ago to come in the end uh, to this team that we think that in the next four or five years that we become the number one team in the world. I mean, it's a, it's an exceptionally young squad you have. Uh, I was my my calculation is that the average age is twenty three. Only one rider uh, thirty or over. Is that deliberate or is that just the way that it's turned out? Uh, yeah, now we are a team that uh, wants to want to develop our own leaders. So uh, when we see a big talent in the junior category, then we will sure not uh, leave them. And then we will we want to have them indeed. And I think over the years, we will see uh, if the development is also going in that way that we uh, thought uh, when, she, when the riders were juniors. I have to say again, I think four or five years ago, it started really like that. And now we come to the point that we are also going to uh, get wins out of that 
uh, starting with Liana Lippert, of course, in the Kettle Evans World Tour race. As you say, she's still very young, and she is known as a, a sprinter. She seems, you know, that sprinting is her main is her main strength and likely to yeah, remain sure. so. Yeah. Um, but do you see her developing into into more of an all rounder? Uh, you know, unable to, yeah. to take on other races as well. Yeah, for sure. She's first of all a sprinter now, and that's her main quality. That's where she wins races with. Yeah, how I always say, yeah, she has a, let's say, a 10 with sprinting. Then we need to keep that at 10 in the end and not making it a, making it a 9 or an 8. And then also making her classic skills an uh, 8 or a 9 because that's maybe not enough to win races in the end. And that's, I think, her uh, special quality is that she can really win races with her sprint. And there are not so many riders who can, uh, who can do that in the end, especially not with the amount that she wins it. She's winning. The cycling podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for their support of the cycling podcast Femina. And you can still get 25% off all your Science and Sport products uh, at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. SISCP25. CP25. CP25, S-A-N-C-P-25. <laughs> ooh, ooh. I love that. You oh, know, no prompting there at all, Rose. No. The thing is, that, no feel, that feels a little bit uh, like an, uh, sort of archaic now, doesn't it? It feels a little bit quint to be singing well, no, on the because, football terraces. You know, the Premier League, Premier League is back. Yeah, but we should have just taken some of our old chants and piped it in and pretended it was live. That would have been much yeah. more current. Pipe in the science and sport code <laughs> yeah. into the Crystal Palace <laughs> games. That's I've been idea. watching nothing but football since it started back, so I'm st- I'm in that. Hoo, hoo, hoo. I'm always ready for a chant now. SISCP25. Did you do it from that window behind you? Did you shout it out at the beach? Hoo, hoo, hoo. Yeah. Every morning. SISCP25. <laughs> yeah. Get your sports nutrition products. I've been going through a lot of science and sports stuff as I've been riding my bike a lot the last couple You're of months. You can trim from this from this angle. Yeah, well, certainly I'm I'm not yeah, I'm not the man I was at the start of lockdown, Orla. <laughs> so I've, many ways. Uh, I've, tr- uh, I've I've shaved off about four kilos oh, wow. actually. Blimey. What's that in the old money? I mean, um what's that? About ten pounds, isn't it? Nearly a stone. Blink yeah. an egg. Yeah, not far off it. Not far That's off good. it. Still a bit more. Still a bit, bit, bit more to go. But I'm working on that. What's your goal, Carol Vorderman? She does the detox things, doesn't she? No, I don't have a goal as such. Just, just, just to keep riding. Keep, keep the keep going yeah. in this direction. We heard before the break there from uh, Lorena Vibus and Hans Timmermans from Team Sunweb and. I was interested to hear her talk about her role within that team. I mean, again, like Big La Katusha, they're a team that started the year looking really good. We we spoke about them, I think, over the, the winter, wondering about where their focus would be, wondering if they were almost too reliant on Corin Rivera, but they did they started the season looking good and they're a very young team. I mean incredibly young team. And clearly building something for the future and Lorena Vibis is part of that, but not the the sort of leader. She's gonna be the leader in certain races um you know obviously she's a fast sprinter but um she's also got a lot to learn in in other races and classics and so on as well so part of an ensemble rather than um being brought in to 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 lead the team yeah we've talked a lot about whether it's a you know whether it's a good move for Vibus or how much of a good move it will be for her you know she she turned professional with Falkenberg it's all she's known um and it's brought her incredible success but you've got to say for Sunweb, it's a brilliant signing, isn't it? When you look at it the other way, because as you say, um, they don't have necessarily a standout star, Corinne Rivera, of course, um, but n- not as dominant as she has been in seasons gone by. To have someone like Vibis on your roster and, and as a selected leader on any given race is a massive boost for them, I would think. Um, she's still incredibly young, so that fits in with, with the demographic, but she's got a lot of racing experience behind her and certainly a lot of winning experience behind her. She's used to leading a team, which not everybody in Sunwear with potential to win necessarily would have. So I think it's a brilliant signing for them, actually. I mean, I think the, the sprint setup is... It's got to be the best in the peloton because they have Leah Kirchman, Corinne Rivera, Lorena Webus. That's just, I mean, that's completely formidable. And what Team Sunweb um, and Hans Tibbermans have always been so good at is designating uh, leaders and designating roles to their team to make sure that people are riding 
Um, so I think there's not going to be that kind of issue where you might get in other teams where uh, every leader wants to play their part and every every fast finisher wants to have a go at glory at the end. So I think, yeah, it'd be really exciting to see how it works works out. Now, Rose, we had some racing, didn't we? We did, of sorts. If yes, yeah, virtual. It was actually. I did you watch? I watched some of that actually, and I even wrote a stage as well of the <laughs> virtual did you, which, women's tour. What, uh, the you mean in real life last year? No, not in real life. On the on the RGT platform. Which one did you do? I, oh, how did you I, fare? I can't remember. Um, it's going to be. Was can, it, it was, it's either it, Canary it was, Wharf. Or no, it wasn't Canary Wharf, and it wasn't Burton Dassett, so it was stage one. So really, you've stage done one. two stages, Richard, because you did Burton Dassett last year in real life, and then you I did, did stage one virtually. Yeah. How did they compare? Yeah, um, and I can ride around Canary Wharf anytime. So um, yeah, it was uh, well, it was good. I went a little bit slower than the, the top riders, but it was it was good fun. I mean, we we did our Giro on the RGT platform as well, and it and it and it is great fun. And I I thought as a spectacle. You know, e-racing is a very pale imitation of real bike racing, but as a spectacle, it was okay. I mean, <laughs> a, it was a ringing endorsement, quite entertaining. And you were building up to it something quite, wonderful there, Richard. It was I, mean, I mean, as a spectacle, I'm not, really, I'm it not was gonna, rather average. I'm not going to, I'm not going to oversell it. I'm not going to oversell it as a spectacle, but it was, it was pretty good pretty good they need to stick that on the poster that's as yeah. a spectacle that was pretty yeah. good yeah i was i was certainly watched it and and you know i was interested in what was happening and the, i mean what what it seems to be good at is replicating riding in a group quite well and and there's a knack to riding in a group on that platform and it's quite hard and it was quite interesting and impressive to see how those riders got to grips with that and how they used that you know, and so there was strategy and there were tactics at play, and uh, that made it more interesting too, more of a spectacle. I have to say, st- stage two, which is the one that the Burton Dassett um, one that Leah Dixon won, was amazing to watch actually. It was really exciting. And to have all those kind of, like you say, Richard, I didn't really ever think that in virtual racing there could be kind of team tactics. I didn't even really, I don't, to be honest, I don't really understand virtual racing whatsoever. I just think it looks like little robots riding. But stage two, which Leah Dixon won, was really, really exciting. What is amazing is how Tibco SVB, they finished so well. And it just shows you how they had really drilled down on what it meant to ride on the RGT platform, what it means to ride in a virtual race and to win. I mean, I didn't even know that they had this kind of massive communication system with DSs and their teammates, but that was a bit of an eye-opener for me. And uh, yeah, Leah Dixon won stage two, and then she went on and won the overall as well. And um, I got to speak to her, and this is what she had to say. Well, Leah, first of all, I should say congratulations on the Skoda V Women's Tour win. Thank you. I'm so pleased. (laughs) Obviously, different circumstances. It's a virtual race, but... The riders that you were riding against were incredibly strong. Did you expect to come out on top? I didn't really know what to expect, to be honest with you. I was really excited to, you know, kind of get some racing in and be able to do the women's tour in some capacity. Um, But obviously the kind of dynamics of the race with it only being three riders per team and then you're kind of not sure how experienced um all the teams are on uh virtual racing as well meant that like you didn't really know what to expect amazing win as well especially as um your team tibco svb did so well do you think that as a team um you approached it a lot differently than the other teams did i think that um since lockdown happened, the team as a whole has really embraced uh, virtual racing and we kind of did a lot of preparation for the stages. So um, I'd already been racing on the RGT platform um, with Lauren Stevens and her husband Matt for some of the um, circuits. We kind of tried to do some research on RGT as well um, and how it works and how it was different to some of the other e-racing platforms and then also we did quite a bit of racing on on Zwift as well so I think that we were a bit more experienced than maybe some of the other teams as to how e-racing is different to road racing. And your tactics were also just completely spot on. I mean, the, the stage that you won, stage two, it was actually a one-two uh, for Tibco, wasn't it? Because Lauren uh, finished second. Um, just talk us through 
you know, how you came up with those tactics for that Burton Dassett stage? Yeah, it's crazy. It's kind of, it's so rare that in any kind of race where you can get, I have a plan and it goes perfect. So for that to happen, it was great. So uh, we had a chat beforehand about what we thought would happen. And I guess everyone expected um, the climb on Burton Dassett to be kind of the deciding factor. And then as we were riding around the lap, ready to go again, um, Lauren came on the team chat and was like, OK, I'm going to try and split the group further. So Lauren attacked and like people kind of chased but kind of didn't. Lauren came over right again and was like, OK, if someone can come over to me, I'll come now. And I was like, OK, I'm going to try. We kind of were able to get the hang of how drafting on RGT worked because we were able to communicate so well over our race radio. Um, and that was it then. We just kept working together for that lap and then just as we were kind of going up the climb the kind of plan was that we wanted to finish together um but you could kind of just obviously see them chasing and then lauren was like right you've got to go now and then it was just kind of all into the finish line and i was really pleased to have got a win and not only that for us to have got um second and fourth i think it was which you know, you couldn't really get much better than that. No, you definitely couldn't. And I think that's so, so interesting, the fact that you guys are all talking to each other. And you also had your DS, Rachel Hederman. What's the setup like when you're doing a virtual race like this one? There's a lot of tech. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it's really good to be able to kind of chat, but I'm not normally doing much chatting because I've normally got a very high heart rate and <laughs> struggling to breathe. So normally it's me apologising in advance for the fact that everyone can hear my really heavy breathing whilst everyone else can kind of tell us what's going on. But um, Rachel does a great job of kind of giving us a plan and tactics and telling us what's happening. And um, Lauren is always really cool, calm and collected in that situation as well. So um, it's, it's quite reassuring to be able to hear people on that race radio. And is it strange that you probably haven't had that much time actually riding in real life with your teammates yeah it is but for me it's been great because like as my first year as a pro cyclist kind of obviously didn't expect any of this to happen it's been a brilliant way to kind of be able to kind of bond with my teammates and kind of um, employ those race tactics and see how things work virtually and hopefully that will kind of put us in better stead for when the race season restarts well, that was Leah Dixon, and uh, it was it was an impressive victory. Will she start the women's tour next year with number one on her back? Good question. That would that's a very good question. Probably not, though. It, it's it is a different race, isn't it? If they do another B series one, then yeah. But I can't imagine. Would it? I don't know. No, I don't imagine so. But um, interesting background and and just how new she is to the the sport, isn't it? I mean, you know, and and she talked a lot about learning you know, even how to ride in a bunch and and that those kind of skills are things she's still working on and of course that's the great thing about e-racing it it's physiology and she's clearly got the engine and i wonder how much confidence she will take from that into races because she's proved herself against some some of the world's best riders in that sort of setting in that environment knowing that she has the 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 engine and um, the capability the physical capability is bound to help her, I would think, in the actual races. I think it's great also. I mean, a lot of the time riders talk about kind of respect and uh, if other riders have respect for you, then they're, they're more likely to actually give you a little bit more space, which sounds like it's the opposite way around. But I think it's always good to have your name out there and your name be a little bit more known. And so for someone who's just new to professional racing, um, I mean, that can't be a bad thing at all. No, well, congratulations to her. And, and you know, as I say, I, I thought it was a pretty well put together event and uh, one of the more entertaining e-races. Now, we've got another we've got another in- interview uh, coming. We're going to hear a little clip of an interview at the end. But Orla, you've spoken at some length to Sinead Reid and the, the reasons were twofold. I mean, I know you've been wanting to speak to her for a while. She's retired now from a BMX racer, but also a track a sprinter as well. And, uh, you know, there's a big hope at one point to partner up with Victoria Pendleton in the team sprint. You know, the, the, the other thing that's on all our radars at the moment is the Black Lives Matter movement. And 
mean, cycling is an overwhelmingly white sport, and certainly at the highest level it is. And Sinead Reid was one of the very few black athletes to compete at the, at the highest level. And uh, that, that was one reason to speak to her. She's also had some well-documented uh, battles, struggles of her, of, of her own in, in retirement as well. And I know you want to speak to her about that to Orla, but you know, we will probably return to the the topic of diversity in cycling after we've heard from her. Um it's a topic we covered in the regular cycling podcast as well. But um we thought as in that episode, we thought in this episode it was far better to hear from somebody with uh, far more relevant experiences of, of this. And that is certainly Sinead Reed is, is one of those people, isn't she? Yeah, um, I mean, you've said it all, really, the reasons that I wanted to speak to her. Um, I, it was it was really the interview, first of all, that caught my eye that, um, that made me want to chat to her most was her being so open about her depression and her alcohol addiction. She's been sober for a few years now, um, and I was just really struck by her honesty. I think it, it can feel quite brutal sometimes when you learn this about someone who's in the public eye and you think you know something about them. You know, you think you know something about whatever their struggles might be because you've read articles. You could do a quick Google search, t- type on the news bar at the top, and you think whatever comes up is the latest thing that's happened in their lives. And so when she was so open about that and realizing that, you know, all of this obviously goes, goes on behind closed doors and the bravery that she had to come out and say that I thought was phenomenal. Um, and it's the kind of thing when someone like Shanae is who has had such success, she's so cool, you know, she's got a great public image and, and someone like her can go through those kinds of problems. I think, uh, it, it's wonderful that she can be so public about it because I think hopefully, um, that will strike a chord with people. Uh, but also, as you say, because of the Black Lives Matter, uh, campaign, and she hadn't, she hadn't spoken about that. Um, so I had no idea what her take on that was going to be. Um, but obviously it was something that was, that was incredibly relevant to talk about. So, um, here is Shania's Reid talking about all of that and a little bit more besides. How big a deal was it for you to be so vocal about the mental health issues that you've gone through? I mean, I was so impressed and so humbled, if that doesn't sound too dramatic, to read about you talking about your alcohol addiction. We just don't really ever read or hear about elite athletes talking about that very much. And I just, I was really taken aback by how honest you were and how how vulnerable you'd made yourself and how brave that was. Yeah, I think think the key word in what you just said is being vulnerable and allowing yourself to be vulnerable because so many people are affected with mental health and addiction of, of different types. And for me, like, I felt like I came out of the other side of it and was stronger in my mind and, and just better than I've been for many, many years, having put in the work to help myself. Um, and I was like, okay, if I've come through this, people have seen my career, people have watched my highs and my lows, but actually from a personal perspective, nobody knew the struggles when the helmet was off and what was going on. And I just thought if I can just help one single person, you know, being vulnerable, allowing to know my story and on how I did it. And, yeah, I just wanted to try and help people because I suffered for a long time in silence and, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't good at all. So I just wanted to kind of break that stigma that's attached to addiction and attached to mental health. And, yeah, just if it helped anyone, great. Um, and that's what it was about for me. How bad did it get for you, Shanice? And do you feel that that's something that you always carry with you? You know, is that something, is that addiction something that you will always have in some way? Yeah, I think I think my addiction, if you, if you even if I look back to when I was like 10 years of age, I was addicted to BMX. Right. Like my personality, when I like something, I want more of it. Um, and I guess then, obviously on the flip side of that, then, you know, my career ended and it was like, okay, what you know what am I what am I about as a person and you know I'm no longer an athlete and and I've really really lost my way and I think then I went into the fellowship of AA which saved my life and yeah I, I mean obviously I'm a recovering alcoholic I don't believe you ever recover from it um and I still go to my regular meetings which I absolutely love and it was about so much more than giving up alcohol it was just understanding how the mind works why I felt certain ways You know, we just kick it around in the meetings, which is fantastic. Um, You know, you don't have to go and pay a psychologist hundreds of pounds to have a meeting. You you pay a pound and you just, you know, kick your stuff around. 
Um, and so, yeah, it is, it's been something that has, you know, changed my life. And it was one of the hardest or the most courageous things I had to do was walk into that meeting on a Wednesday night in Wilmslow, you know, nearly three years ago now. Um, but it was the best decision that I ever, you know, I ever made. I want to ask you about the Black Lives Matters campaign right now. First of all, just how you're seeing it, you know, what's your perspective on everything that's happening in the world at the minute? Obviously, what's happening in the world in general um, is, you know, it's pretty chaotic, isn't it? Um, But I think the Black Lives Matter campaign or, you know, people pushing that, I think it's fantastic to... You know, I've never person personally been affected by racism, um, so I can't, you know, share any of my stories. Um, I've always been welcomed anywhere I've gone, which has been great. But I just think it's just tragic, um, you know, to witness that unfold. And I guess a part of it, we all played a part. I watched the Jay Shetty thing the other day, and I think we all played a part in that happening because, you know, it's not spoken about enough. This still goes on. It's not just a new case that's happened. And I think shedding light and, and shedding energy and focus to it is, is amazing. And it's something where I've, I've sat, on, sat on the fence slightly because I'm like, you know, like I'm like, how to, how best is to approach this? Because I know some people are saying, well, all lives matter, not just Black Lives Matter, and I get that. But it's you know, like it's this is happening, you know, regular to to people of color, and it's something that I really would like to to push and be a part of. But it's just how I do that that gives the best, it gives the best, gets the best impact and the most positivity, really. So why do you think you have sat on the fence, or or in what way do you think you've sat on the fence? I think, you know, I, like, I always I hope people can see I'm an honest person. I think it's fear. I think it is genuinely fear because it's like I, I don't really want to say the wrong thing because I'm, I'm you know, a person of colour myself and I don't want people to to kind of judge me if I have said the wrong thing. But then, you know, is there, any, is there a such thing as a wrong thing to say if you're talking from the heart? And I think it's just, yeah, I guess it just boils down to fear and, and me actually speaking some truths on it. I try and do it like just generally being a positive person and having, you know, positivity spread wide. Um, but, I, you know, I do feel in a position where I do need to do more on Black Lives Matter. And it's something I'm looking at, you know, speaking um, with Emma, my agent, um, on how best to do that. Um, but I just think maybe I just need to be like I was with the alcoholism and just be honest and speak from my heart, really. When it comes to cycling, I mean, I've often, often wondered why cycling is such a white sport. I know it's not the only one, uh, far from it, but because it's the one that I'm involved in, I've wondered why it's, why it is so white. But I've always been afraid of even asking the question because I feel like, well, that's not my question to ask because I'm not affected by it when, of course, I'm affected by it because I'm in this sport. And if it's restricted in any way, then... Yeah. then either either it is affecting you without realising it or you're somehow helping to perpetuate it without even realising it. I don't know, is that worse? Um, yeah. Why do you think it is, though? Why do you think cycling is such a white sport? Is How big a problem is that? What what can be done? I mean, like, in BMX, is, is the, you know, like, I believe there's a lot, there's a lot of, like, uh, mixed-race people and black people within BMX. And I think it comes down to... I, I, asked, I got asked this question the other day. And how I was, how I kind of summed it up is like I remember going to the Track World Championships uh, um, with Victoria Pendleton in two thousand and seven, and I literally looked around and there was me and Gregory Borge were the only two black people race competing in the whole of the World Championships, and I guess I, at that point because I didn't really know you know the history of track cycling, but then as time went on, I was just like you know there's no person of colour or, or you know on the on the GB team and I and I my theory of, on it is a you need role models you know like obviously I, I hope I helped in terms of people could see that a person of colour was involved in track cycling and then the same in BMX I know a lot of people um from like Peckham and other areas that are now on the GB team I mean we've got three of the five lads are mixed race so that's great to see but on the other side of the fence, there's no other mixed race person. And I just think I spoke to British Cycling because I'm so passionate about protecting, you know, the sport and what we can do to move forwards. I think their testing protocols could be better. Um, I think, you know, where they go and do talent ID searches, not just in, you know, middle class um, schools or even the private schools that they go into, but actually just, you know, going into these affluent areas and, and seeking talent there 
because I was that kid. I mean, I've just come back from the BMX track now, and I was that kid that couldn't afford to to, to buy a BMX bike, and I used to hire one out for a pound. Um, and I just think, yeah, if, if them opportunities and, and, and them doors that were available to me aren't there in road cycling and in track cycling and other cycling disciplines and other sports, um, I think it just puts barriers up and then, you know, they just get put off by it. So that was Shanice Reed, And as you said at the start of that interview, Orla, um, incredibly open uh, about what she's been through. And it's, well, it's refreshing to hear somebody talk with such honesty about such a personal issue. Um, but the other thing you spoke to her about, uh, or one of the other things you spoke to her about was, you know, her, her, her take on Black Lives Matter and racism in, in cycling, because as I said at the start, it is a sport without a great deal of diversity. And I suppose all of us the last few weeks who are involved in cycling, who, who like cycling, cover it, um, have all been asking ourselves the question, why why is that and what could be done to improve the situation i mean one of, one of the things she said in the interview was that british cycling um have some responsibility she's obviously a, a british cyclist um, and governing bodies everywhere have responsibility but uh, she wondered about um you know their talent id programs which are have had some great successes um you know when they've gone into schools and found talented youngsters but what schools have they gone into she asked you know have they gone into inner city schools or have they tended to focus on more affluent areas because cycling is an, can be an expensive sport or is an expensive sport and and does that limit the the types of people that you're um exposing to cycling and, and who and, and and you know creating pathways for on the on this topic i got in touch with scott Dougal at british cycling he's the head of communications and we had a long conversation about it and he 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 said that it was a completely legitimate comment observation by chinese to ask about that because it's it's true that in the past, I think they haven't uh, gone into as wide a range of schools as they should have done. But he gave me this quote, improving diversity in cycling has been a clear priority for British cycling for many years. While we have made significant advances in some areas, particularly narrowing the gender gap, there's still a great deal to do. We recognise that a lack of diverse ethnic representation is a significant problem and a historical legacy that those of us who love cycling must tackle if we want to say with credibility that ours is a sport open to all. And he did say that, you know, the, the, the time it takes to run these sorts of programs um, and to then see results, it, it can be a long, long time. And I think they're further ahead in addressing the, the, the gender gap. And interestingly, he said that they've now got more female members than they had overall members 15 years ago. But the gap is still almost as big, you know, so proportionally um, there's still, uh, you know, as few female members but there are a lot more of them but you know it, it takes a long time if you're going to start going into schools and uh identifying kids at age th 12 13 14 15 it's going to be a decade till they start to have success in elite sport so it, it takes a while but um it's certainly a uh, you know a really valid uh, comment and observation by chinese and one that british cycling do have to address did he say anything about what they're doing in terms of racial diversity you know they might be ahead of where we realize them to be when it comes to gender diversity but you know whenever they said that it was a fair comment is that something that they had already started to work on or is that is that going to have to be a new move for them do you know did he say because i think i think there's a danger whenever we talk about sometimes diversity as being sort of a catch-all issue you know that it's easy sometimes and this is not i mean scott is one of the most wonderful well-intentioned um people i've ever worked with in cycling never mind press officers or anything um so this isn't about british cycling it's not about scott it's it's more what we don't want to do is confuse the issue you know and say that diversity well we've got the gender bit ticked so that will do for diversity for now because you, you know they're obviously incredibly different um socioeconomic issues at play or or historical cultural whatever they are but they're you know they're very very different issues affecting gender and racial diversity in cycling i mean on that they they're they seem to be targeting their efforts more in cities and he's he mentioned go ride which is their entry-level cycle sport program um and they've got those uh, initiatives running in Bristol, Manchester, Birmingham, London, and Leeds um, at the moment. So they are they are targeting, he said, 
you know city you know cities where inner cities where perhaps you know in the past when they were looking just for talent and for kids from families who'd be able to support them and afford it they were perhaps looking in in other places um so i think they've they've they're spreading the net but um as he said it, it's it's going to be a long a long process and you know it's not just the uk i mean when we were talking about it on the regular podcast it struck me that you know france is a curious case isn't it because it's such a diverse country or it, it seems so and and if you look at the football team it's got a real mix of you know black players and white players um, but there have been so few French riders, French black riders who've made it. And, and one of them, unfortunately, Kevin Reza, has been racially abused on at least one occasion. So it, it, it's not the, the story in France has not been great. And I, want, I, wonder, I wonder why. Um, I think the socioeconomic aspect is perhaps the most significant one. I'd say whatever. I mean, if some people listening to this might have a better t- sort of insight into this than us and it'd be wonderful to hear from anyone who who has experience or knowledge or insight in any way but I would imagine you know when you say about the issues in France they're probably quite similar to the UK you know whereby cycling used to be a sport of the people it's now much more an elitist sport um to make the comparison with football you know any kid can kick a ball against a wall um and it's it's open to a lot more people so I guess it's it's that accessibility and visibility which are the keys really to entry to any sport i think also cycling has that uh, runs in the family more than other sports do or i mean at least kind of football everyone plays football but often when you speak to current pro riders they always say that their grandfathers uh rode bikes um and they you know did quite well or you know kind of good amateurs and i think maybe that that is part of the issue i mean cycling has i think has a problem with reaching out to new audiences and reaching out to people who wouldn't already be aware of the sport. And I think its lack of diversity is is certainly a part of that. Because I think the conversation is almost never had in cycling, whereas in other spheres of public life, there are, you know, conversations about racism, whether, you know, they might not get anywhere, but at least those conversations um, happen. But I think in cycling, it never does because it, it is so, so white. You do hear about uh, I've heard from pro current pro riders um, about hearing racist things being said or DSs making racist remarks. So just because it seems to, I mean, we only seem to have this conversation when you have the odd circumstance when something racist has been said and it has actually been heard and recorded and reported. I mean that that's a very tiny proportion of the actual number of instances that probably happen in the pro peloton. In the other podcast, the regular podcast, we had a, a chat with Matt Rabin uh, last week, who is a chiropractor at EF um, Pro Cycling, and he's a black guy who grew up in London, and you know, said that one of the big issues for any kid is role models, and and you do tend to you know latch on to people with whom you can relate. So for me as a kid, it was Robert Miller, you know, the only Scotsman in in professional cycling. For Matt. You know, he went to school with Bradley Wiggins. Wiggins, you know, had his, his father um, was was his, I suppose, role model in a way or certainly the inspiration for him to, to take up cycling. But Matt couldn't have imagined being drawn to cycling at all because there was nobody who he could have related to. And that, that still remains the case now. And, you know, we heard from Sinead Reid and, you know, you wonder, she was, I remember going to Beijing, she was the the poster girl, certainly for BMX, which was a new sport there it was it was cool it was exciting it was it was different and there was a lot of hope and expectation on her shoulders to win a gold medal and and you just wonder if if she had managed to win that gold medal how things might have been different not on a on a grand scale but there would have perhaps been you know one or two or three or four or five young black girls who'd have looked at her and really aspired to to that or or you know gone to a local bmx track and bmxing is is the branch of cycling as scott dougal was telling me where there is greater representation greater diversity because there are bmx tracks in inner city areas in london and so on where kids can go and and ride their bikes or or borrow a bike and ride a bike you know there are there is a sort of sort of structure a loose informal structure around that 
Um, and I wonder, you just wonder, because that BMXing can, of course, be a, you know, a pathway into other forms of cycling, whether it be track cycling or road cycling. You would hope that, you know, she didn't win the gold medal, but she did get a great amount of publicity in the run-up to those games. Um, she was one of the names um, and one of the faces, and you would hope that, that that in itself maybe would make a difference. And I think maybe that's where things can change slightly. We don't um, We don't always give the um, most publicity to the person who's won the most. It's whoever's got the most interesting story. It's whoever stands out for any number of reasons, you know. And as the media, I do think we we have a, a responsibility. I mean, for us, we talk about women's professional cycling. The riders have to be there. That's, that's what our remit is. But, you know, collectively, and, and we've got a role to play in that, we can do more to give more visibility to certain people. And I think that they're, they're the kind of uncomfortable things that we all have to think about, what our role is. And that's everybody listening. That's us. That's um, But I don't want to say everybody listening as if that's to say that we don't have a greater responsibility. We're very privileged to be working in the media, you know, and, and to be giving coverage to this sport. So um, that is that is also our responsibility. It's not just about the people who win the medals. It's about the people who, you know, if you believe that journalism has an has an ethical, has a moral responsibility, which I have, which I believe, I think we all do to a certain extent, then then we believe that maybe helping to provide those positive role models, which we talk about an awful lot, because we do talk, you know, it is women's cycling, um, and we talk about the promotion of role models more than you need to talk about when it comes to men's cycling. You know, we need to be aware of that responsibility as well, I think. Finally this month, we're going to hear just a, a clip of an interview I've done with Hannah Rhodes, a, a British writer who broke the world Everesting record. Now, this is something that's that's come to our attention because quite a lot of high-profile writers have gone for it. It's basically climbing the height of Everest. Um, now, what's interesting in repeated efforts up a climb, and, and it's fascinating to think about the strategy for that. Do you go for a very steep climb or a less steep climb. What's the most efficient way to do it? Um, Hannah Rhodes is not a you know well-known rider in elite circles, but she is a specialist hill climber, and she likes these kind of quirky challenges, it seems, and, and she's got her eyes set on, on a few others. You'll hear the full interview in the next episode of Explore, um, the podcast that we do every month, uh, Lionel Burney, Hannah Troop, and Ian Boswell, about the world of backpacking, adventure racing, and all kinds of other cycling off the beaten track. Um, but let's hear a little extract from Hannah Rhodes, um, who went out and smashed this Everesting world record. So tell me, I mean, when you set your heart on this, wh- how did you go about planning it and how do you select the, the climb that you want to use? So I had a bit of a look around this on Segment Explore on Strava and I wasn't really, because I've never really thought about it before, I wasn't sure what the right kind of great, like the best gradient would be for the hill. So I kind of just looked for something that was reasonably straight and steep and then looked at how far I could be away from the quad and still be like within the world record pace. And Kirkston was the best that I found. Did you have several kind of candidates that you, you thought about? And what, what were the factors? I guess there's a balance between, you know, steep. you want it to be steep to gain the elevation, but, you know, not too steep that it's going to pose a problem to, to keep riding repeatedly and over that length of time. Yeah, that's interesting because that's kind of what I thought. But then looking back at the stats on my ride, like the steeper it gets, the more elevation I was gaining per second um, for the same amount of power. So did you do quite a lot of analysis of this? I'm, I'm a bit that way inclined. So I've had a look. I've had a look at my ride. Like I've had a look at my ride afterwards, maybe thinking about doing it again. And then beforehand, I guess I did a reasonable amount of analysis on it. I looked at a lot of climbs in the UK and just wrote them off. <laughs> so I think the climb was, the segment that I chose was 10.9%. And I averaged between like 270 watts and 200 watts, which is probably not the best pacing. The total elevation for the day was 30,700 foot, I think, but you only need 29,000 for the record. For anybody that works in metres, I think that's 8,848 metres and 9,300 metres if you include the additional reps that I did. I was the total riding time was uh, total elapsed time was nine hours and 
eight minutes. I think I was stopped for 15 minutes, which included me running to a stream to fill up my water bottle because I only took juice and then got really, really thirsty about uh, hour three, um, which is maybe not recommendable for people going for world record Everest. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was great about Hannah was that she um, she'd sort of trained for this and had it in her sights, but she was on a sort of practice run. She'd been dropped off by her dad and her brother, who then went off kayaking for the day and left her on her own. And she went up and down this climb, and after about five hours, realised that she was on course for the record. So she just decided to keep going, but she'd done it all. <laughs> she'd done it all on her own, and uh, she then got support. I think her boyfriend arrived, and her her dad and brother came back from their days kayaking and gave her a bit bit of support in the last few hours. But a uh, phenomenal achievement, and uh, well, just a mind boggling effort. Um, and uh, Rose is shaking her head. I don't think she's going to be going for the Everesting <laughs> world record anytime I, soon. No, I, I'm not shaking my head at the the effort because it's it's phenomenal. But I I don't even like thinking about it. It makes me feel makes me feel anxious. I don't know why. I just hate that idea. I hate just what part of it? All the riding or I just all I the climbing? I, just all the all of it. The length of time <laughs> on the bike, the going up the same the same climb over and over and over and over again for like ten hours. It just I don't I don't like I, you know, I will I can't wait to <laughs> hear from Hannah Rhodes about it, uh, in the episode of Explore, of course. I will be listening to that, but I don't know. It just just the, the trying to There are reasons why it. professional bike riders are professional bike riders oh, and the rest yeah. of us talk oh, about God. it. Let's just put it like that. Yeah. yeah. Hannah Hannah, you can rest easy. Rose is not gonna be <laughs> targeting your record anytime soon uh, and orla and orla might struggle in the netherlands to, <laughs> to have a go no, since richard sure. took part in the uh, v series race maybe you'll be having a go at the woman's everesting record oh, next, that's richard. not for me worth saying that she broke the the all-time record for men or women um she she now just holds the women's record because uh, a male rider has gone quicker but um yeah not it's not something i'm gonna be not something i'm gonna be doing <laughs> Uh, not shame, for me not shame. for me that I, I i need to lose more than four kilos before i have a go at that it's still <laughs> that's not still that's not how you're going to shift the next four kilos then taking on no. everest of burton no. no. dasset again back to burton dasset you go <laughs> oh my well how when, many when we're times burton dasset, dasset have you worked it out i mean i'd rather oh god i'd rather uh, when you were talking about burton dasset earlier um rose before we heard from leah dixon I was think, casting my mind back to Burton Dassett last the rain. year. And the, the Do you remember the chic rain? rain? I'm thinking that, at le- you know, the, the E version of it was definitely better than that. Well, listen, we should wrap things up for this month. We'll be back next month, um, a bit closer to the racing. Yeah, ask us that question. You know, the, re- the question that we weren't entirely sure of the answer to at the start of mm. the episode, which was, do we feel like we're closer to actual racing starting again? Ask us next month. I've got a sneaking suspicion we might have a better answer think you might be right well whatever oh, uh, racing there is now we're at least an hour closer than we were at the we beginning are. of the episode <laughs> i was gonna <laughs> make that it very starts point again. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah we are we are definitely closer an hour than we and were 30 seconds when we started this conversation <laughs> <laughs> we're closer to death than we were at the start of this oh, conversation as well but anyway um that's all for this month thank you very much note. rose thank you richard thanks orla thanks orla thank you both